waters, Lord. When I feel the waves around me calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in me. Knowing you love me, through the burdens I must bear, hearing your footsteps, lets me know I'm in your care. And in the night of my life, you bring the promise of day. Here is my hand, show me the way. I feel the waves around me calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in me. Knowing you love me helps me face another day, hearing your footsteps. Drives the clouds and fears away And in the tears of my life I see the sorrow you bore Here is my pain Heal it once more When I think I'm going under Part the waters, Lord I feel the waves around me calm the sea. When I cry for help, oh, hear me, Lord, and hold out your hand. Touch my life, still the raging storm in me. Touch my life, still the raging storm. Jesus has a difficult message for his disciples. <clears throat> I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I'm under until it's completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it's going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky. But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Dear Jesus, I'd like to thank you for the uplifting message this morning. It's always so nice to come to church and hear positive messages like, you're bringing fire to the earth, that you've come to bring division instead of peace in this already divisive time, that you've come to bring division against households, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, although, Jesus, you didn't have to come to bring that division. That's kind of the natural state of things, you know. Not everyone's like Ruth and Naomi. <laughs> and Jesus, thank you for the reminder that we are, in fact, hypocrites who have no idea what's going on around us. Your faith in us is truly encouraging. 
Thank you for this message so that those who are visiting our congregation for the first time, who may have been away from church for a while, have a nice welcoming message so that they can feel like they truly belong. To recap, thank you for raining fire, the deep division, and reminding us that we are blind to what's going on around us. Sincerely, Caleb. Well, I suppose we can safely file this in the category of things we wish Jesus had never said, can't we? <laughs> this is a difficult scripture. What was Jesus thinking? Didn't he know the kind of conflict that this would bring to us 2,000 years later? Jesus says, do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? Well, yes, actually. Isn't he the Prince of Peace? What's he doing? Why is he talking about this? This is a scripture that has been misunderstood and misappropriated by a lot of people, particularly fire and brimstone preachers over the years, who say that you're either with us or you're against us. Either you believe the right thing or you're in trouble because God is going to rain fire from the sky. You hypocrites! And remember that whenever they're pointing out and saying, you hypocrites, that there are, what, three fingers pointed back at them? It's a difficult scripture. It's been misappropriated. Didn't Jesus know that this would come up in the lectionary and preachers would have to deal with this? <laughs> what is this scripture lesson about? Jesus comes to bring division. Well, actually, in Jesus' life, some of the things he did were pretty divisive. In fact, you'll remember that he asked his disciples to leave their families, leave behind everything they knew, their families, their friends, their homes, their money, and to come and follow him. I imagine in a pre-Skype, pre-FaceTime world, that wasn't a particularly popular decision. They didn't know if they'd ever come back or not. But as difficult as that was in Jesus' lifetime, perhaps becoming a follower of Jesus was even more divisive after Jesus had been crucified. Those decades after his death were an extremely difficult time, particularly when the Gospel of Luke was written, in which we find today's scripture lesson. It was most likely written around 85 of the current of the common era, about 55 years or so after Jesus' crucifixion. And it was kind of a divisive time. It was in the famed Pax Romana, but as Mayflower Congregational Minister Robin Myers is fond of saying, Pax Romana was only Pax if you were Romana. <laughs> the way that the Romans kept the peace was by oppressing minority groups, particularly the Jews in Judea and followers of the way, as early Christians were called. It wasn't particularly easy to be a Jesus follower in those first few decades, and in fact, first few centuries. You'll remember that Jesus was executed for sedition because the Romans were afraid that he was going to incite rebellion. So they didn't particularly want the disciples having a revival. They didn't want a lot of people finding newfound enthusiasm to follow Jesus. They wanted him gone. And so the Romans persecuted early followers of the way. It meant that they had to meet in secret in people's homes and catacombs and graveyards, fearing that the Romans might be there coming to knock down their doors. But you'll likely remember that if a person decided to join the faith, they usually made that decision not just for themselves, but for their entire families. Which means that they were taking their life and their family's lives in their own hands whenever they decided to join up and become a Jesus follower. I imagine that was probably a little divisive in families. I'm sure not everyone was really on board with that lifestyle. Dodging the Romans, wondering if they were going to make it or not. And the Romans persecuted people in the early church for the first three centuries or so. 
It wasn't until 313 when Constantine and Licentius issued the Edict of Milan, which granted toleration of religions in the Roman Empire, including but not limited to Christianity, that Christians could breathe a little easier. Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, as is often thought. That didn't happen until decades later in 380. But it was tough to be a Christian in those first few centuries. And in some ways, when the empire finally embraced Christianity, it changed it. Christianity had been a minority religion that spoke the truth and love to power. But in some ways, when the empire embraced it, Christians became the powerful ones. They became the ones who made the decisions. And for a lot of places throughout time, it has been advantageous to be a Christian. There are certainly Christians all around the world who have to fear for their lives, but in the Western world, it has traditionally been advantageous to identify as a Christian. I mean, when was the last time you were afraid to come to church because you thought people might be scared of what you were doing here? Jesus was a little divisive, and following him could be kind of scary. And so I think that this means that we have to hold true to those core values of our Christian faith. We have to hold true to mercy, to compassion, to love, and to name those places in our world where that's not happening. And friends, that can be a little divisive. What that means quite simply is that we can't be tolerant of intolerance. I've heard a lot of Christians say that, that that's one of the hardest things, is to be tolerant of intolerance. But friends, that is not our call, to be tolerant of intolerance. Our call is to name injustice where we see it, to speak the truth in love, still responding with mercy and compassion, but speaking Jesus' message that can sometimes be a little divisive. We want a world that's filled with peace and harmony, that's absent of conflict. Of course, we want to live and let live, but that has its limits. When we see things that are incompatible with our beliefs, with our values, then we have to name those. Or another way to say that is that famed quote that's been attributed to many people over the years, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> right? There are certain things that are acceptable and certain things that aren't. And people who aren't showing love and compassion and mercy are not acting acceptably. And naming that can be a little divisive. It can feel a little bit like raining fire. It can be tough. Particularly since we as Christians are called to love the people who we would much rather hate. I'm reminded of the death of Fred Phelps a couple of years ago. Phelps was, of course, the famed, or perhaps infamous, founder of Westboro Baptist Church. In one of life's odd little ironies, before he founded that church, he was a lawyer who stood up for minorities who had been discriminated against but then founded this church and spent most of his life preaching hate in the name of God, which in my opinion is one of the most grievous of all sins. It's hard to find much that's nice to say about Fred Phelps. When he died, I saw a lot of people really celebrating and rejoicing in that. People saying that they were going to go and picket his funeral as he had picketed so many others. kind of had a problem with that. People of faith rejoicing that someone had died, even if it was someone who was horrible. But then I saw a different response. George Takei, you know, Star Trek's Mr. Sulu, you know I'm a Trekkie. 
He has a huge online following because he's hilarious. But in one of his more serious moments, he said, Mr. Phelps, today I imagine you discovered that God, in fact, hates no one. Vulgar and despicable as he was, may Mr. Phelps find the peace in death that was clearly so elusive in his life. Takei is a Buddhist, but that was perhaps the most Christian sentiment that I saw on Facebook, the most faith-filled response to that, naming that the things he did were inexcusable, yet somehow finding a way to respond with mercy and compassion. Friends, living like that is not easy. Some days I wonder how on earth Jesus thought we could do that. But it's what we're called to do nonetheless. It can be divisive. It can feel like God's raining fire. And yet, what a wonderful call if we're able to live into it. Dear Jesus, thank you for asking us to take the difficult path when we're so often encouraged to just do what's quickest and easiest. Thank you for baptizing us with fire every now and again and igniting our souls with passion. We ask for your help in working for peace by naming injustice, yet embodying compassion and living faithfully. Sincerely, Caleb. Amen.